State University Small Farm Outreach Program, we'd like to welcome Chris Sims from Farm Credit. He's going to talk today about credit scores, credit reports, and budgeting. So Chris, I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Susan, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and share uh, some of the information on, on credit reports and, and credit scores and, and, um, and then finishing up with some budgeting. So. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I am uh, I'm the regional lending manager for Colonial Farm Credit, covering basically the southeast portion of uh, Virginia. Um, I've been in the ag finance business working with Farm Credit uh, for 21 years now. Uh, so what I'll be sharing with you today uh, is the experience and knowledge that I've gained over those 21 years working directly with uh, farm operations, both large and small, and meeting their financing needs uh, on, a, on a daily basis. Uh, so with that, we'll get started here. Um, and let me get the... There we go. Uh, so a quick overview of of what we're going to be covering. Um, I'm going to give you a quick overview, talk about farm credit just in general, uh, who we are, what we do, and then um, that's going to set a good groundwork for the next session uh, that will be coming up in September uh, when Andrew Turner is actually going to be sharing about presenting to your lender uh, so that you can have an idea about who we are, what we do, and how to be prepared for actually talking with your lender uh, on, on uh, loan options and, and how to meet the funding needs. Uh, from there, we're going to talk about understanding your credit score, but also talk about understanding your credit report. Um, we'll go into cash flow budgeting. Uh, if you think about cash flow budgeting, it's really the essential part of sound financial management. Uh, and then this final topic I'll uh, cover is about rural resilience. It's a program that Farm Credit has uh, partnered with a number of other organizations and uh, wanted to share that uh, here uh, just to get the word out. Um, during, the, during the session, uh, feel free to put any questions, comments uh, into the chat, um, and those will be sharing. Certainly appreciate questions, observations, along the way be glad to stop and answer those questions at any time so uh, feel free to put those out there and susan will be monitoring that and uh, we'll be we'll be answering those questions along the way as well so to get started with a quick farm credit overview uh, farm credit is actually 104 years old we were actually chartered by congress in 1960. Uh, farm credit system serves all 50 states including uh, puerto rico uh, our mission is to provide sound and dependable credit to America's farmers, ranchers, and rural communities, both in good time and bad. Uh, so, so we've seen it all, we've worked through it all, and we're committed to continuing to work uh, with, with rural customers, farmers, ranchers, both in good and bad times. Colonial Farm Credit is the local farm credit association that covers Eastern Virginia, and five counties in Southeast Maryland. Uh, we have about 76 employees, 13 offices, and one of the keys about farm credit is that we are a borrower-owned cooperative. So our, our customers actually own the cooperative uh, and, and are the owners of the business. Uh, where we located this, just give you a quick map of the locations uh, for where farm credit is located, uh, closest to the Virginia State area, uh, we've got our Dinwiddie office and then a Waverly office, uh, but we surround the, um, the area in all of, all of Eastern Virginia. Uh, as I mentioned, we're cooperative. Our customers are our owners. Uh, the other unique thing is that all of our directors are local to the area, and they are all farmers. They have a vested interest in the mission of farm credit because they are farmers. They understand that. The other key part is we actually share our profits with our customers. Uh, so we have a patronage refund program uh, that is declared annually by our board of directors 
in which we refund a portion of the profit from the cooperative directly back to our customers. That has a significant financial impact on improving the life of rural America, improving our customers' life as well. Uh, our loan officers, all of our employees live within the area that they serve. Uh, so we, we really understand rural agriculture. Uh, we understand rural living. So we connect it directly and have that expertise. We make loans both to full-time farmers and part-time farmers um, for any, pretty much any needs related to the farm operation. In addition, we make rural homeowner loans. So if you live in the say, county of Dinwiddie, county of Prince George, county of Chesterfield, any of the counties that's defined as a rural area, we can make loans to those individuals for their home-related needs. So whether it's purchasing a lot, constructing a house, buying a house, refinancing, we can do anything related to their primary residence needs. I mentioned our patrons refund program. It's really the item that distinguishes us from any other lender in that the profits from the business are paid back to our customers in order to actually reduce your cost of borrowing. Um, so if you have any questions about farm credit, uh, certainly reach out to myself, reach out to your local office. We can certainly uh, put you in touch with the right person and then also uh, uh, be glad to talk with you and, and see how we can meet your needs. Uh, as I said, Andrew, next month in September session, we'll be talking more about specifically the loans, how to consider structuring it, what options are available, how to communicate that with the lender. Uh, to let them know what you actually need. So let's dive into credit scores now. So we're talking about understanding your credit score, uh, really the basics of credit scores, or credit reports, sorry. We're going to start with credit reports, then we'll move over into credit scores. Uh, the basic, basics of the credit report is that there are three primary credit bureaus. It's important to understand that. Um, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion are the three main credit bureaus out there. Really, on the East Coast, you see Equifax a lot more. Um, there are some other, uh, other uh, institutions, Experian, TransUnion, that are a little bit more Midwest to West. Um, and so, it's important to keep that in mind. Um, it's also important to understand that your credit file at each of the credit bureaus is going to be rel rarely will it be identical. Uh, your information in one credit bureau may change and be a little bit different uh, than what the other credit bureau is. Some of it deals with timing of when the monthly information is received by each bureau. Uh, it could also be a difference in which creditors report to which uh, bureaus as well. Uh, so just know that there could be differences among the three uh, credit bureaus out there. Okay. What's in your credit report? Uh, your credit report really contains four different pieces of information. Uh, it contains your personal information, such as your name, your address, your social security number, your date of birth, your employment information. That's more biographical information uh, that it contains to help the lender be able to make sure that they've got the correct information for the correct person. That personal information does not factor into your credit score. So that's not used in the calculation of your credit score. The, uh, the second part of that is going to be your account information. This is going to be the most critical uh, part as it's got all of the information regarding your loan accounts. Specifically note that it's only for the accounts for lenders that report to the credit agency. Uh, there are local banks that actually do not report to the credit agency for various reasons. 
Uh, so just know that it's only going to be for the accounts that actually are reported. It will have information regarding the date that the account was opened, your credit limit if it's a line of credit or credit card, and or uh, the loan amount if it's a term loan. Uh, so if it was a vehicle loan, a home loan, it's going to have the initial credit balance listed on there. It'll have your current account balance, and then it'll have your payment history. Uh, it would tell you whether you've paid all of your payments on time, which is a critical component to your credit score that we'll talk about in just a few minutes, or whether there's been any late payments along the way. Uh, the third item that's going to list is going to be inquiries. This is going to be a list of what lenders have actually obtained a copy of your credit report in the last two years. Uh, there is actually a difference between what shows up on inquiries, whether it's a hard pull or a soft pull. A hard pull would be any um, lender that has pulled your credit because of a specific application for credit. So if you apply for a new credit card or you apply for a new vehicle loan, those applications and credit pulls because of those applications are considered hard pulls. A soft pull would be if you obtained your credit file or you get in the mail a lot of times uh, maybe applications for credit cards or promotional items for credit cards. Those are considered soft pulls or marketing pulls. They do not impact your credit score. They do not impact the inquiries. They don't show up on the inquiries. So it's only the ones where you've actually applied for credit that would show up as an inquiry. Final thing that shows up on your credit reports uh, would be negative items. These are going to be any delinquencies, any collections, any judgments, any bankruptcies, foreclosures, or tax liens. So anything of negative nature uh, that would show up uh, that, that would be in your history would show up on your credit report as well. A common question that we uh, that we frequently see. Make sure I. Okay, before I go into some of the common questions, and I've already put up the first answer here. Um, these are some common myths and facts uh, that that it's important to know. Uh, the first one is a. Approaching your credit limit will not negatively impact uh, your credit scores. Um, that's actually false. The, the credit limit, if, if you are approaching your credit limit, let's say you have a $10,000 uh, credit limit and you have used $9,000 of that on a credit card, approaching that limit will actually impact your credit score. Uh, so that, that will have uh, an impact there. Second item, uh, second myth or potential fact, uh, can you dispute items on your credit report? Uh, so give you a second to think about, can you, can you dispute items on your credit report? And if you'd like to answer, certainly put that into the uh, Facebook comments as well. And that's actually true. So you can dispute any items that are on your credit report. There's actually a pretty high percentage of, of uh, mistakes that could actually show up on there. So I'll talk in a few minutes about uh, actually getting copies of your credit report, how you can do that. Uh, I would encourage you to do that and specifically to look at it to see are there any potential mistakes on there that you could dispute uh, to actually see uh, if you can get those corrected. Third, third myth or fact, it will always help my credit score to close an account that's paid in full. Think about that for just a minute. And that's actually false. 
if you have been paying account an account on time, uh, you're actually better to keep that, say, credit card open. If you've had a, a credit card for a number of years that you've been paying on time, uh, you're better off to keep that open rather than actually closing it. Credit agencies, in the, in the way the scores are set up, they actually look at length of time for your credit relationships. The longer that you have a length of time for your credit relationship, the better it is to them from the scoring algorithms that they use. Uh, so having that longer credit history on an account that is paid as, as scheduled uh, is, is a positive for you. Number four, uh, there's no one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to credit scores, credit reports, and credit behavior. And that's actually true. Uh, every situation is unique. Every individual's situation is unique. Uh, scores are unique both to individuals as well as scores are unique between each of the three credit agencies that I mentioned. Uh, as I said, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion may all have different information. And as such, the credit scores and the credit reports may vary between all of them. Uh, likewise, there are different scoring models within each of the um, credit agencies that could be a little bit different. So there's not one size fits all um, solution or uh, standard that goes along with it. Uh, everybody's is going to be unique. I already talked a little bit about this uh, fifth question here. Uh, checking your credit scores will not impact them. And that's true. As I said, that's considered a soft pull. That actually does not impact your credit score. Uh, and I would encourage you uh, to um, make sure that, that you uh, uh, check that at least annually. Uh, and maybe uh, quarterly or, or as frequently as possible. Uh, number six, we touched on a little bit. You have a universal or overall credit score. Uh, that's false. Uh, we talked about that. At, that varies among each of the credit agencies and then among each of the different scoring uh, parameters as, as well. Number seven, your relationship status and whether you live alone can impact your credit scores. That's false. Uh, as we mentioned, your biographical information uh, does not factor into a score. Number eight, good credit scores do not necessarily mean your credit application will be approved. That's actually true. Uh, there, there are more than just credit scores that go into banks making decisions uh, on your credit applications. For example, one of the most common items that actually is paired with your credit score is going to be a payment to income ratio. Uh, that's true for mortgage loans, uh, whereas um, we will look at what is the total amount of debt payments on a monthly basis that you would have relative to the amount of income. And there's going to be parameters assigned around that as to the percentage uh, that we don't want to see more than, say, 35% of your monthly gross income going towards debt servicing. Uh, so there would be a payment to income ratio that's factored in there. Uh, so just because you have a good credit score doesn't necessarily mean you can get approved. It helps, but it's not the only item. Uh, final question here, if I pay off a debt, any late or missed payments on that account will be removed. And that's actually false, which leads right into the next uh, item to think about on your credit report, is how long does information stay on your credit report? So most negative items will stay on for seven years. Uh, late payments stay on seven years from the delinquency date, uh, whenever that may be. Uh, collections would be seven years from the first missed payment date. One of the most common collection items we actually see on credit reports is medical collection items. Uh, so um, that's one of the things to be aware of is, is to be aware of collection items that could be impacting you uh, out there and having a negative impact 
uh, when you score. Bankruptcy stay on seven to ten years, depending on the uh, level of uh, or, or which type of chapter of bankruptcy. So they do stay on for an extended period of time. Closed accounts, we talked about if you've got a, a good account, actually keep it open. Um, closed accounts paid as agreed, they have a positive impact. They stay on your report for up to 10 years. Uh, An active account, so this is where we talk about don't close the account. If you've got a, a credit card that you've been paying on time, had it for a period of time, uh, keep it open because active accounts that have a positive history stay on your account, on your credit report as long as that account is open. Uh, so they're good to go the whole time. And then the hard pull, when you make an application and that hard pull, uh, that does stay on for up to two years. Any questions on credit reports at this point? All right, here nothing will we'll go on into understanding your credit score. The credit report's the first part and the information in your credit report actually uh, relates over into your credit score. Um, the most widely used credit score is the FICO score. Um, FICO is uh, the Fair Isaacs Corporation that developed uh, that scoring model. Uh, there, are, there is not just one single FICO score. Um, there are numerous multiple scores along the way. Uh, so it could be any different types of, of models that Fair Isaacs uses. Uh, there's a FICO 9, there's, there's various different credit scores out there. Your credit score is essentially just a mathematical equation. So it looks at everything that's in your credit report and it uses a mathematical equation to identify your level of, of future credit risk. Uh, so as we talked about the FICO score, they can vary across each of the major credit reporting agencies. In general, your FICO score is going to range somewhere between 300 to 850. Uh, the national average is right about 687 roughly. Um, and I've included below the distribution of FICO scores. So you see that generally um, you want to be somewhere around that 700 and higher higher range um, to to be looked at in a favorable standpoint as your as your credit is uh, is being considered. Uh, so that that's the point that you want to be at, and you see how the national distribution of those scores uh, relates. So how is your FICO score calculated? I want to give you a breakdown of what really goes into determining that score. Uh, so it's a, it's a factor of a number of different items. I mentioned payment history is extremely critical. 35% uh, of your credit score is actually determined by your payment history. So have you paid all of your accounts on time? Are there any delinquencies out there? Are there 30, 60, 90 day past dues on your payment history? Uh, are there any public records or collection items out there? All of, the, all of those factor in and impact 35% uh, of determining your score. The next part of it that makes up 30% is the amount owed. Uh, so how much do you owe on your accounts? Uh, and this is where we talk about the balance relative to the available credit. Credit agencies like to see that you have availability to a large amount of credit. Generally, over $10,000 in available credit uh, on credit cards is really what they like to see, but they don't want to see you using 90% of that. So if you've got $10,000 in availability, they don't want to see that you're using up $9,000 of it. They want to see it's available, but they want to see that you have minimal use of that. Uh, so if you were using 1000 or 2000 of that a month, paying it off, that's the type of uh, balances that they want to see relative out there. 
So it's all about how are you using your credit and what do you owe on each of those credits. The next thing is the length of history. That accounts for about 15%. Um, generally, a longer credit history is going to be beneficial to your score. Uh, so just know that, that that does come into play there uh, as to the length of history has a significant component for determining your score. New credit. This is where we talked about the hard pulls versus the soft pulls. Um, you often hear a lot of, lot of misconception around uh, the number of pulls having a significant impact on your score. Uh, it does have some impact, but it's a very minor impact at only about 10% of what you have out there. And then the final component is your mix of credit cards or mix of credit. So do you have a mix of credit cards? Do you have retail accounts? Do you have term loans on vehicles? Uh, do you have mortgage loans? What is that mix of credit that you have out there? Uh, credit agencies and their mathematical consideration of that algorithm wants to see a good mix of cards that you actually, or accounts that you have outstanding. What doesn't your score include? Uh, it doesn't include anything related to race, color, religion, national origin, sex, marital status, age, salary, occupation, uh, where you live, um, interest rates on particular credit cards, accounts, uh, whether you're paying any child support, whether you have any rental agreements, none of that is included in your credit report. Your credit score is specifically based on the way you have handled your credit, the way you've made your payments, what balances you have relative to the availability, how many inquiries you've had, and how that credit mix is. So it's specifically related to those actual accounts out there. Also, I mentioned here again, certain types of inquiries, the hard pulls versus the soft pulls. Those soft pulls do not impact your credit. So when you're pulling your credit report to check it yourself, that does not uh, impact your, your credit score. I talked about I would encourage you to actually check your credit uh, report and credit score yourself. Uh, actually, there is a law in place uh, passed a number of years ago now that provides you free access to your credit report at each of the agencies uh, every 12 months. So every 12 months, every year, you are entitled to be able to get a free copy of your credit report from Equifax, a free copy from Experian, and a free copy from TransUnion. I would encourage you to take advantage of that, to check your, your report for any mistakes. Uh, you will have to pay to get a copy of your score. So you, so you do get a copy of your report for free, but to get the score, they would charge you for that, and it's a minimal cost. The website to go to to actually get that is annualcreditreport.com. Uh, that, is, that is the government site. It's the only site uh, that you can go to to actually get it for free at no cost um, according to the actual law that was passed. So annualcreditreport.com is the place to go in order to be able to get, get a copy of that. So with that, that covers the part about credit reports or credit scores. I'll pause there for just a minute. I'll see if there are any questions that, that pop up related to either of those. Chris, this is Susan. Um, whatever that tapping is, is continuing. So I'm not sure where it's coming from. I was quiet for a minute. All right, yeah, I'm not, not sure. Okay, now we'll sh shift gears and, and talk a little bit about cash flow budgeting for you. Okay, we'll go ahead and get, 
shift gears here into the cash flow budgeting part of, of what we're discussing and um, and talk about how you can how you can use budgeting to improve your operation, uh, improve your management of your operation, but also then uh, getting prepared for presenting your plan uh, to other other parties, whether it's for uh, financing or whether it's for other investors uh, or whoever it may be. Uh, but the big part about it is making sure that you have the plan to be able to budget and be able to manage your operation to be successful. So with that, I want to I want to share and give you a few things to think about uh, as we get into this. Um, Bobby talked last month about goal setting, about business planning. As part of that is what is your vision? Uh, what is your vision for the future of your operation? Uh, if you don't have a vision, if you don't have that path of where you want to go, then it's difficult to actually be able to budget to get you there. So the first thing is you've got to go through that business planning process to begin to develop your vision, to develop your goals, to develop your mission, to know where it is you want to go uh, to make sure you can get there. The risk of not planning and the risk of not having that vision is that your family living expenses and a potential lack of liquidity could stress your business cash flow uh, and vice versa. So we want to make sure that you have a plan both for your, your business and both for your family so that you don't have that inner relation to the, the chance of risking uh, either one of them being stressed uh, by not having a good plan in place. We also want to make sure that by planning, we can reduce the risk of your household debt affecting your business debt and also your business debt potentially affecting household debt. Uh, so without proper planning, there's the potential that the debt you're carrying from a personal standpoint could impact your borrowing ability for your business or that your business debt could impact your borrowing ability for your household, uh, for your personal needs. So we always want to make sure that, that we're planning for those two items there. The other thing to keep in mind is that by not having a plan in place to make sure that we're paying ourselves, then we take the risk of reinvesting everything into the business, which can have an impact on the household as well. So we want to make sure that we're allocating to be able to pay ourselves and be able to, to set that money away for future needs, whether it's uh, future needs for retirement, whatever those future needs may be. We just want to be mindful of that risk of if we're plowing everything back into the business, uh, just recognize the risk that can come with that. I talked about having that vision. I talked about uh, making sure we know what our mission is, where we're going. As we get into the budgeting side of this, we want to make sure that if we know where we're going, we're on the correct road to get there. So having that budget, having that plan in place, make sure that we're on the correct road to get where we want to go. Because if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there, right? But is it that correct road that we actually want to be on? Is it to the spot that we want to go? So we want to plan and we want to budget to make sure that we have that roadmap. We know which track we need to be on to make sure we get there. As we plan for that chosen road, uh, Bobby talked last month about setting goals. We need to set both long-term and short-term goals. We want to think about those goals both in the form of business goals, but we also want to think about family goals. We also want to think about personal goals. They should all be distinct, separate uh, goals of what do we want for our business, what do we want for our family. Make sure you're having the discussions with your family about what those goals are, and then also what are the personal goals we have. Final thing is we add all that together into the business plan. This is where uh, we'll get into the budgeting part of the business plan uh, in the next slide here. We want to make sure that as we're planning this vision, as we're planning our mission, as we're planning our goal, that we talk with our family, we talk with our business partners about those goals and, uh, and about those finances. 
if you look at the statistics, approximately 40% of U.S. adults have a budget and track it, which means 60% don't. And that's where we'll get into that point of uh, just a second of how do you develop that budget? How do you start thinking about that budget and putting it together so that you can go from being in the 60% block to being in the 40% of folks that have the budget and track it and use it to their benefit? Uh, you also think about it, 76% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, we want to make sure that we're budgeting and we're living with our means and using that both in, in the business and in our personal life um, so that we can so we can be budgeted to know this is what we've got and this is how we can make it work and have that plan. And then 25% of adults do not have an, or do not or cannot pay their bills on time. Uh, that relates back to credit scores, credit reports, which has an impact on your borrowing ability. Uh, so having that budget together just helps us to be that much more prepared for being able to pay the bills on time. So as we start to think about developing a cash flow budget, uh, the first time is not going to be easy. You know, if we if we go out kayaking in the ocean, that's a big ocean, and if we thought about how do we paddle out there, that seems insurmountable. But what you have to do is take it one stroke at a time. Okay, what seems insurmountable, what seems difficult, what seems is going to be a challenge the first time, is worth it in the end. It just takes the persistence to be able to get there one stroke at the time. Uh, so it's developing your cash flow budget for the first time is not going to be easy. Um, but with persistence, with work, with putting a good team together around you, uh, it can be done and the, and the benefits much outweigh uh, the cost and the time to put that together. As we begin to look at the basics of a budget, uh, really it comes down to three things. What's the sources of income that we have? What's the cash coming in? As you start putting together your budget, thinking about it, be sure to think about all the income sources you have. Uh, for your farm operation, it could be not just the crops that you're selling, uh, but also any government payments. Uh, it could be uh, anything. Uh, could be the sale of equipment. If you had equipment that you were selling from a capital asset standpoint, we want to make sure we're considering that source of that income. Uh, so it's going to be your, your first, your sources, that cash income coming in. Second component is going to be your cash going out. How are you using that cash that's available to you? That's going to include your operating expenses. It's important to include capital purchases. Uh, we always want to make sure that we're planning for those capital purchases. Is there a piece of equipment we need to buy this year or maybe next year or within the next five years? And how do we include that in our budget to make sure that we're planning it? Uh, most large businesses actually have a capital uh, plan in place. Uh, so they'll look five years ahead and have it laid out. What are the pieces of equipment? What are the capital items we need to buy over that period so that they can be looking forward? Uh, that's one of the things I would encourage you to do is also look, look that five year time frame forward so that you can plan for that potential equipment purchases and know how to get there. Cash going out would also include your debt servicing. Uh, you want to make sure you're, you're appropriately budgeting for that debt that would need to be serviced. Uh, you need to include ta taxes, whether it's personal property taxes, whether it's real estate taxes, whether it's income taxes. You want to make sure that you're, you're planning for in your budget the tax obligations you may have. And then the final thing is uh, the cash going out, the uses of it is planning for your living expenses, planning for your household needs. Uh, that's where if you put together then your personal budget, you can use that number into your business budget from the living expenses and household needs standpoint. And then at the end would be the cash remaining. Uh, we all hope we have cash remaining at the end of the budget. Um, but if we, if we go through this process, if we think about it, and then in the end we see that we have a shortfall, that gives us an opportunity to go back and re-examine how we can make some changes in there to budget it. 
just from a simple concept, this gets a little bit more complex. Uh, just thinking about cash flow budgeting. Uh, I'll talk in a few minutes about some some tips for budgeting, uh, how to consider it. One of the things, if you think about it, if you're doing it on a monthly basis, uh, in January we'd have total income available, we'd have our cost, uh, we'd have our net margin, we have our beginning cash. To that, we add the uh, net margin that we had available, positive or negative, to get our ending cash which becomes our beginning cash in February, we do it all over again. Uh, so uh, one of the ways that you can do it is doing it on a monthly basis. I'll talk about that a little bit more um, in a few slides on finding the item that best fits your need uh, from the time frame of what to do. Uh, but just the concept of it here uh, is the way we work through this. The way to put your budget together can be as complex as you want it to. Uh, it could be in an Excel spreadsheet. It could be in a computer software program. This is just an example of an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and actually, what I can do is uh, I do have uh, this template available to you. I'll share a website address on the next slide. Uh, but I also have hard copy uh, file already available. Uh, if you'll contact uh, Susan, at Virginia State, and I will make available to her those resources uh, that she can share to you, along with some other information from this uh, session today. But I do have this Excel uh, spreadsheet that you can use and customize uh, to your operation itself. If you are using Excel, that's great. It's a powerful tool. Uh, I use it on a daily basis. Um, there are also other programs out there that you can use, such as uh, QuickBooks or Quicken. Either of those have budgeting options uh, that you can use where you can also then track your expenses as well. Uh, so either one of those works, works great as well. What I would just encourage you to do is find the program that works best for you and then just use that uh, to benefit yourself. This is the email ad or the website address I mentioned. Uh, it's a very long um, website address. If you go to farmbiztrainer.com, uh, you can ultimately then get to resources, then to groups, and then to the one play one page planning suite. Um, but I'll leave this up for just a second uh, so that you're able to write this website down. And there's also a lot of other good information at this site other than just uh, some Excel spreadsheets for using and developing your, your budget. Uh, so take a few minutes and, and actually go there and, and dive into that a little bit and see what resources might be available to help you out. I'll share a few tips on creating a budget, just some things that came to mind from my 21 years of experience in the ag lending industry. Uh, that, that you consider as you put these budgets together. Um, I mentioned you want to create your budget based on the appropriate period for your specific operation. So whether that's a monthly budget, whether it's quarterly, whether it's semi-annual, whether it's annual, whether it's all of the above, find the period that's appropriate for you and, and put it together from that standpoint. Second item, be careful of intermingling business and personal income and expenses when budgeting. Uh, so we want to keep our business separate from our personal. Uh, so make sure you have a separate business budget from a separate household budget. Keep those two separated and apart from each other so that you can appropriately um, review and consider changes to each of them independently. Uh, we, want, we don't want to intermingle our business and personal sides. When you're putting together your expenses in your budget, don't forget to expense for the non-monthly payments. So something like insurance is gonna be a non-monthly payment, whereas you might have to pay farm owner's insurance or your liability insurance on an annual basis. You would have taxes for personal property and real estate on an annual basis. Uh, so don't forget to be able to include those non-monthly type payments as you develop your budget. 
Uh, be consistent when you put your budget together. Uh, be consistent in the way you consider income. Be consistent in the way you consider expenses, but also make it realistic. Uh, so we want to make sure that, that we're using realistic, potentially uh, attainable numbers. We don't want to be overly optimistic. We don't want to be too conservative. There's a place to have an optimistic budget. There's a place to have a pessimistic budget um, from a stress testing standpoint. But really look for something that's realistic in the middle of the road. I already talked about considering and planning for your capital purchases. Uh, an important component of what you do in putting together the budget. Uh, talked about summarizing your debt repayment and including in the appropriate period. So if you're doing a monthly uh, budget, make sure that you're including that debt repayment in the appropriate month that it's actually due. Uh, next item, next thought is from time to time, actually review your budget and see where you stand. Uh, that goes to the bottom here that I'll talk about in number 10 in a minute. But, but dust this thing off and, and look at it from time to time and see where you stand throughout the year and see if any changes are needed. Uh, search out and utilize available resources. There are a lot of available resources out there. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on that again in just a few minutes. Uh, but search out and utilize those available resources. Uh, keep in mind that your budget is unique to your operation. Uh, it is your budget. It is your operation. You know your operation best. So don't try to find something that worked for somebody else and make it work for your operation. You know your operation. Make it unique. Make it your own. And then track and compare your actuals to your budget. Uh, find the means that we talked about on whatever works best, whether it's Excel, whether it's a written ledger whether it's something like QuickBooks or Quicken, use that to develop your, your budget, but then also use it to track your actuals and compare to your budget. Uh, we would call that in the business world variance reporting. What is the variance between my budgeted numbers and the actual numbers? So look at the variances between the two. Track them, look at them, but then go deeper. Dive into it, be curious. If there is something that, that's a variance, a significant variance, what caused it? Is it a positive item? Is it a negative item? But things are going to happen there. So be prepared for it, but dive into it and analyze it and understand how those changes and what might have gone well for you might would have gone wrong um, could uh, result in how you need to either change your budget or make adjustments to your business or lifestyle. So as I said, just some tips there uh, in creating budgets and, and how to really go about looking at that and diving into it deeper. One of the common questions we hear, and I know um, that Bobby shared from the last session, uh, was how do I know how to price my product? How do I know how to price my tomatoes or whatever it may be that you're selling, how do I know how to price those? From an economist standpoint, the first thing that they would ask you is, what is your cost of production? So if you have a budget together, you can begin to start uh, figuring out what is your cost of production per item. Uh, but one of the other things that I, that I recently found I want to share here is the Virginia Department of Agriculture actually issues as part of their market reports uh, and actually a farmer's market report. So if you go to the VDAC, VDAC's website under their market reports, there's actually a Virginia retail farmer's market report uh, as well as more regional reports as well. But you can get access to the information in the surveys. Uh, I believe they're posted on a, on a monthly basis of, of a selection of farmers markets around uh, the state and the prices for different commodities at each of those uh, farmers markets. So just something I'd happen to come on, uh, found recently, wanted to share it here as a potentially good resource for a common question we hear along the way. So a couple of final thoughts as we 
as we put a wrap on the budget side of this is planning for the future of your farm business is not a one-time event. Okay, it it's, should be an annual cycle at a minimum, could be more frequent. But as I said, you need to dust off that budget every so often and take a look at it and continue the planning cycle. Develop your cycle of how often you should be planning and make sure that it's an ongoing event, not a one-time event. I talked about along the way you're gonna need help. Uh, it's understandable that you need help and be willing to ask for that help as you need in building your business and building your budget in planning for your business and planning for the future of your family and your family operation. Uh, put your team together. That could include attorneys, financial planners, accountants, lenders, appraisers, insurance agents, um, extension agents. I included friends on here. You know, find, find that close friend that can be your sounding board uh, that can help you and, and listen to what you're sharing and be able to give you good, honest feedback and be open to that feedback. Uh, it could be a forester, it could be a mediator. Uh, any of those could be on your team to help you with, with planning and executing your plan and your vision for your operation. And as we, as we think about budgets, uh, putting, putting this all together, I've never gotten on a plane to fly somewhere and the captain came on and said, well, I think we might be going to Denver and maybe we have a plan to get there and hopefully we get there in the end. Because if they ever did and the captain ever came on and said that, I'd be looking to get off that plane. I wouldn't feel comfortable flying if they didn't have a plan to safely get me there. So by planning where you are going financially, and that includes with budget, by planning your budget, then you can increase your chances of arriving there safely. So we want to make sure we put in the planning that we need to to be able to, to increase our chances of arriving there in a safe manner. With that, I'll pause right there just to see if there are any questions on uh, budgets prior to one final little quick item I want to share. Okay, final thing I wanted to share here um, is a partnership that Farm Credit's put together with several other um, groups out there, Farm Bureau and, and some others, uh, to support rural communities and agriculture uh, during the difficult times that the farm economy has been facing. Uh, it's called Rural Resilience, and it's training material that's actually focused on mental health and stress management. Um, the website for it is farmcredit.com slash rural-resilience, R-E-S-I-L-I-E-N-C-E, -E, rural resilience. On that site is available uh, some training to help with um, understanding how to manage stress, communicating regarding it, suicide awareness, uh, and other topics. It's actually developed by Michigan State University uh, and actually sponsored by Farm Credit, American Farm Bureau, and the National Farmers Union. I would encourage you to uh, take an opportunity to go out there and explore that information, some really valuable and powerful information uh, and, and something very important that we consider uh, given the current current times that we're in uh, and the stress that, that exists both in our business lives and in our personal lives. Uh, so on that site, if you go to that site, it's going to have a lot of information there, but there'll be a link that says take the course. It's free to take, no cost. Uh, estimate about 30 minutes uh, um, for some of the sessions up to about 60 to 75 minutes. So uh, a few hours of your time can get you some access to some really, really valuable and important information uh, out there. So uh, with that, I wanted to share that one bit of information. Uh, with you and, and certainly feel free to share that with others that could benefit from that. With that, that concludes what I've got. Final question for you. As you think about your vision, as you think about uh, your credit, your credit scores, your budget, your planning, how you put all that together, 
and how you make sure that your family and your farm is prepared for the future. The most valuable thing we can do is be prepared that our family can, can be prepared to continue on in the future and be successful. And so with that, we tile this up and we wanna make sure that your farm and your family are prepared for the future. Uh, so I, I pause there, uh, open it up to any final questions and uh, appreciate the time to have uh, presented um, on the various topics today. And if I can be of any assistance in the future, certainly feel free to reach out and, and uh, ask for any questions you have. With that, Susan, I am I am done. All right, I think we're good to go. Thank you for staying with us today and talking about credit scores, credit reports, and budget.